and I'm asking him for $100,000 and he reaches in his coat pocket, like over dinner, I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> this can't be real. Working as a stock boy, dropping French fries at the Arby's. He's like, good luck with that. We'll see you coming crawling back when things don't work out. Been 20 plus years, never came crawling back. This is brutal, man. Got some clients, lost all the clients, had to lay off people. If you continue to define yourself and you see your self-worth through the lens of other people, you're gonna chase this thing for the rest of your life. Or uh, straight men have a pretty boring sense of fashion. I'm like, oh my God, what is this place? For the first time in my life, I see my future. Chris, thank you so much for taking out the time. This has been an insane journey. I used to watch your videos in 2020. The first video I watched of yours was the one in which we're talking about how you grew on Instagram for using the AIDA framework. Yes. And since then, I've just been a fan of all of your coachings, all of your teaching material. Thank you so much, first of all. And how are you doing there? I'm doing great. Thanks for watching and thanks for mentioning that video. Uh, that was a live stream from Adobe Max, I believe, a couple of years back. So I'm, I'm glad you were able to pick up on that video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So today I wanted to make a video for the people who are watching who are sort of my age and they want to sort of start their personal brand. And they're also sort of a creative could be someone who's building designs or someone who's writing code. So for anyone who's in these niches, how can they sort of bring out their A game and make a living doing what they love? That's been like the motto of my channel. Now I want to start with the okay. first dream that you had, the purpose that you had, and that was to impact a billion people. How did you come up with that, with that purpose of yours? Uh, the story is uh, we were still in transition from being a service design company into the future and many of my team were moving from the server side and helping me make content. And we had this management meeting, we're all talking and they're like, so what's the purpose of the future? Is it to make money? Is it to make courses? What are we trying to do? Is it a mastermind group? And I didn't have like a really short answer. And I was telling them that for me, education is a deep passion of mine. And I wanna be able to create an alternative to traditional school. I believe in education. I just don't believe in the high cost of tuition. I don't believe in student debt. And I said, you know, my kids are too old for this, but by the time we're done, if we've accomplished our goals, uh, Ben, who's my chief operating officer, I said, when your little girls are old enough to go to college, I want them to be able to be able to choose between traditional school or something like our school and feel like it's not a compromise. And that night I went home, I just started thinking about it. That story takes too long to say. Mm -hmm. So I came back the next morning and said, hey guys, here, here's, what, here's what it is. Our mission is to teach a billion people how to make a living doing what they love. Mm -hmm. And it, it was first making money doing what they love, but I didn't like the word money because people can define their success in many different metrics. It could be about quality of life, um, relationships, family or whatever. So just make a living doing what they love without feeling gross about it. And how close are you to that 1 billion number? I'm very far away from it, <laughs> to be honest. I know some people have said it, got, it has to be a billion now. I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah. That means like one in eight people on planet Earth would have to be directly or indirectly impacted by what we do. Mm -hmm. I think the ring one is directly impacted. I can say a couple of million and then indirectly impacted, I don't know. So if one person influences five people, then that's a pretty good number. If they can influence a hundred or a thousand people, then I know we'll reach that goal. Hmm. Very interesting. So, you know, the, you have this one pinned uh, tweet on your Twitter account and that is, I'm 51, yeah. started YouTube at 42, got serious on IG at 46, YouTube subs now 2.1 million, IG 80K, LinkedIn 420K, Twitter 100K, and that is just incredible. I did it, you can too. So I wanted to talk about this because it's been over four and a half years when I started to here, got to 1.5 million on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But I want you to talk about sort of the benefit that building a personal brand on this scale has brought to you and to your career so that people can understand why is this really important for them in their career to think about. Okay. <laughs> We live in an age of abundance and we have too many choices. We don't have like one burger place. We have a hundred burger places. We don't have one kind of bottled water. We have 130 kinds of bottled water. And so what, what happens is there's this thing called the paradox of choice that the more options that you have, the harder it is for you to make a decision. So when somebody's looking to hire a, a social media strategist, a content creator, a graphic designer, they have too many choices out there. They can hire not just anybody in town, in state, in country, but anywhere in the world. And that's the kind of competition that you're competing against. Mm -hmm. So 
when we look at how we decide who we work with, I think there's a couple of things that we we use instinctively to decide. So I'll, I'll kind of point that out. Number one is familiarity. So if you've heard of a brand before, if somebody's talked about it, if you've seen it on TV, if it's part of like your group of friends who are using it or talking about it, then you're more likely to pick that brand up than the com competitors. So familiarity is one of those things. And then with familiarity comes trust. So if you use it one time, it could be a product or a drink or a restaurant and you're like, I had a really good experience. And the next time they consistently show up and deliver the same level or better then your ability to trust them is going to grow. And you're going to then tell other people, hey, when you're in town, stay at this hotel, when you're in town, eat at this restaurant or watch this movie, because I think part of it is the reason why we recommend things to other people is it gives us some status. Mm. It's a small bit, but it gives us some status like I've tried lots of restaurants. I know which ones are good or bad. And then if I can recommend something good and you like it, then my status in my mind goes up a little bit with you. So when it comes to building your personal brand, if you just do the work, then you're just like water, just like the hotel, you're just like the restaurant and familiarity is hard to come by. Yeah. So, But if you start to tell your story and your lens of how you see things, then people get to n become more familiar with you and other people see you and talk about you. And what we what we do is we create social proof. Right. So when somebody looks at two designers and they see one has a million followers and one has four followers, if they can't tell the difference, then they're going to go with a million. Mm -hmm. And I'll prove it to you in that if you go and do a search on YouTube for like how to fix a leak in a pipe, when you see a bunch of videos, I almost guarantee you the one that has the most views is the one you're going to click on first. Because there is something about group intelligence that the crowd has watched other videos and they say that this is the one that, that is the good one. Mm -hmm. So you get the benefit of that. How has it impacted me? Well, I'm a graphic designer. I'm a I'm introverted. I, I don't like to be around people. I don't network. I don't socialize very much. You call yourself a loud introvert. I'm a loud introvert. <laughs> we can explain that later if you want. So how is it that I'm able to get invited to speak and be the opening or closing keynote at very prestigious events? Why is it that they pay me and fly me out? My feeling is not because I'm that much smarter than anybody or I'm that much more accomplished. It's because I've made it really easy for people to become familiar with me. And if I've been doing this now 10 years, then to say like, the guy keeps showing up, he's not going away and he keeps doing it consistently, if not better each time. Mm -hmm. So then our levels of trust is going to grow. So they book me because of that. So if I'm an aspiring uh, keynote speaker, this is something I need to do to become uh, to build an audience, to get social proof, and then more people become aware, and then therefore familiarity goes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel there's so much to talk about here, but the first one that I want to touch upon is the fact that starting a personal brand, putting yourself out there can be very daunting for a lot of people. Because when you put yourself out there and you don't see the numbers, then you just sort of think about, am I not good enough? What do you think are some of the preconceived notions that keep people uh, from unlocking their true potential on social media? What do you think that would be? Okay, let's address the fear. When you put yourself out there, people are going to judge you, they're gonna criticize you, and you're looking for a lot of that uh, external validation. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. This is you uh, being a child who's still inside a, an adult body, still a child looking for the approval from your parent, from someone you respect, a teacher, an older sibling, something like that. And I think we, we need to get rid of that. We need to start to become more intrinsically motivated by what drives us. And so when you post something and you know what's good, who cares if 10 people see it? Mm -hmm. That's just a side effect of the quality of the content that you're trying to create. And so I think we get too caught up in these external metrics. Like uh, when we're in grade school, we're looking for... Uh, um, like high grades, high marks, a high test score. And then we're looking to test into certain schools. And if we get into the program and we graduate with a certain degree from a very prestigious university, those are all external markers for our internal value. But if you continue to define yourself and you see your self-worth through the lens of other people, you're going to chase this thing for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And you're going to feel pretty empty. And you feel like, oh, I'm getting closer to something. And you can just never reach it. It's like a rainbow. Yeah. You see the rainbow and you're like, I'm going to get really close to the rainbow. And no matter how much you travel in the direction of the rainbow, you can never touch the rainbow. Yeah, It's kind of like that. So I say to everyone, the journey of building your personal brand begins inward. It's about understanding who you are, your story, and being brave enough to say, I'm going to be me. That's the best thing I can do. And I'm going to then attract people who like that and repel people who don't. And I'm going to be okay with that.
That's not to say that you should be content with where you're at in life today. You can love all of who you are while you work on all that you want to become. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I've never had friends in my whole school career, school, school life. When I was in my school, I changed 10 cities in 12 years of my schooling in mm. 14 different schools. Mm. And so as a result of that, I've never had friends yep. for my entire school time. But when I put out a video on YouTube and I first did that in 2020, I saw 10 views. I could see 15 views or, or even 50 views. And that was insane. Yep. I would imagine 50 people sitting in a room and watching my video. And that to me was incredible because I've never had people who would listen to me, who would want to know what I have to say. Yep. So sort of that perspective I had, and I was always grateful for even the 50 views I used to get. Yeah. And and last month, I the channel got 26 million views on YouTube. Mm. And I'm just beyond uh, grateful for everything that I've been able to achieve because of that. But I want to talk about one very important thing I observed about you in all of the videos and right now talking to you as well. And that is your communication ability, right? You've talked about how you've gone on stages, you've delivered talks to thousands of people. What helps you communicate better? I know there's practice is one because you're doing it for so many years, but what is it? Because I've seen that you communicate with clarity and you're to the point. There are no ums and ahs. It's delivered to the point. How are you able to develop that? And how can someone who's watching my video, an 18 or 20 year old can learn to do the same? Well, first of all, I just want to say congratulations to you that you've only been doing this for four years. Four years. And you're up to one point, what, how many million? 1.45 million on YouTube. That's incredible. So you're growing much faster than we are. So <laughs> congratulations, young man. Thank you. You're putting in the work. Obviously, you know what you're doing. And I can tell there's a professionalism to what you're doing, despite your young age, right? So let's talk about how you can improve in your communication skills. Number one is to study. I think it's very important to study. And the first thing that you can do is you can expand your vocabulary. The other thing that you can do is you can learn to speak and articulate yourself clearly to enunciate words. And a lot of times I think what happens is we're not confident about what we say. So we tend to mumble our words. Mm. We say it kind of under our breath because in case someone doesn't want to hear it or we think the idea is dumb, they can pretend like they don't understand us. And the, there's a guy, his name is Vin Zhang, and he does a lot of communication things. I'm not a communication coach or an expert. I can just tell you what's worked for me, but some of the tips he gives really seem to work. And when he says that when you're speaking with an accent, over enunciate words. He said, just read something and just over pronounce all the words and go very, very slowly. It'll help you to avoid from mumbling. The whole filler words like um, like, you know, so, and whatnot. Those are things that just require a lot of deliberate practice. The younger you are when you start this, the better off you'll be. Both my children, they're young-ish, and when they talk, they're like, dad, like, you know, like, like, and I said, hey, at some point in your life, people are gonna judge you in the way that you speak, and when you use those filler words, it's going to erode their confidence in you, or, their perception of your intelligence. I know you're super intelligent, so let's work on communicating clearly. There's a book that I read, I forget the name of the title, but it's something like how to talk like TED Talks. Yeah. And in that book, I think it's written by a guy named Jonathan Donovan or something like that. Follow up with me later and I'll find out the name of the book. But he's like, practice this idea, it's called the burst technique. Are you familiar with the burst technique? I'm not. Okay, so if you imagine there's a river and we build a dam and the dam holds back the water. And at a certain point, the water rises to a point in which it becomes kind of dangerous. So then they open the valve and the water bursts out. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people do is they're still thinking about what they're saying while they're opening up the dam. So they'll begin a thought and then the thought will change and it'll change again. And so we're getting a lot of fragmented run on sentences. So what we should do is we should think about what we want to say, organize the thoughts in a logical order, and if we can, it's like, here are the three tips on public speaking and then say number one and then just let it burst and then stop. The other tip I want to share with people is it's OK for you to take a moment to think about what you want to say. And just hold space for silence. We're so uncomfortable with silence. That's why we use um, um, um. Just be quiet. Let it build up, organize your thoughts and then communicate it in one clean, smooth go. Silence is irritating for a lot of people. It is. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, talking about building a personal brand on social media, you know, 2024 is a year where so much has changed in terms of how these platforms work. 
Previously, when I watched your video, it was all about creating those carousals, having that first picture, which is very loud and catches attention of people is what you talked about to catch attention. But what do you think works in today's year in this in this day and age? Because a lot of the creators were even smaller. If they create a great reel that can go viral. I don't have TikTok in my country, so I could not talk about that. But there are, there's a lot of uh, freedom now in people who can create a piece of content that can go viral. So what do you think should be the right way for someone to grow on social media? I would caution everyone who's starting out to chase viral content. I, I say one of those things where be careful what you wish for because you might actually get it. So let's say you've only created 12 videos and you're only in year one of your content creation game. And all of a sudden the 13th video that you put out goes viral. Mm. And you're like, oh my God, this is so great. And a whole bunch of people are watching. I'm, I'm blowing up on socials and you're so excited. Then the next thing you create doesn't get a lot of views. And the next thing you create doesn't get a lot of views. And then all of a sudden you start to have a different story inside, which is, God, I suck. But prior to that, you were doing just fine mm. and you were happy with the 200 views that you got. But then you got one that has 2 million views and now you feel terrible about yourself. What a horrible way to live. So what's your option? You're like, I got to go back and I create another video like that first video that blew up. And then you do another one that's almost like it, but a little bit different. And it, let's say it blows up again. And you're like, okay, now I know what the internet wants. And so you create more and more content. And then fast forward a year later, you realize the channel went in a whole different direction than what you feel happy about, where what lights you up and, and puts your soul on fire. So now you become a slave to the viral, the algorithm that that you, you want to get that same result, that same the viral high, if you will. Mm -hmm. But you don't even like the content you create. So now you feel like this is a job and that passion, that spark is gone. So I say to people, be very careful about what you wish for. I think what you need to do is to work in relative anonymity for about two years to practice your craft, to learn what audiences want, to find out what you really want. And then you start to make an intentional effort to like try to build something because you've had enough. You, you had enough at bats. That's like an expression that we say here, like in baseball, like you've taken enough swings. Mm -hmm. So you kind of know the feel of the game and you know what you want in life. Yeah. Right. That's the problem. <laughs> so one thing that I observed about you is your fashion sense, right? Why do you think that matters for a designer? And I would also love to know about the story behind the God is a designer cap that you used to wear. You're not wearing that right now. Yes. <laughs> so okay. how, how does this, did this all came together? Okay. I, I like nice clothes, but I have a pretty conservative uh, aesthetic. And I think most men that are, are straight men have a pretty boring sense of fashion. We, we're not really uh, intentional but with what we wear. We just go with the kind of mainstream standards of what is fashionable. We don't want to look sloppy. We want to look professional. And so you, you might wear a shirt, pants that are pressed, and then a tie sometimes depending on the event. And then I go to a wedding. It's one of my students and it's he's Filipino. And I see somebody walking across the middle of the banquet hall. And it's the guy who's got the coolest style. He's Filipino and he's wearing a flat brim cap. And, and I asked my former student who's getting married, like, who's that guy? He goes, oh, he's the DJ. I'm like, duh, of course the DJ has got the most drippiest outfit, right? I was thinking, okay, I didn't think I could wear flat brim caps. And I started wearing some caps. It served two, two uh, uh, problems or it, it solved two problems for me. Number one is, you may know, I'm bald. I'm Asian, so that means I have like fairly medium to oily skin. And it used to be a problem for our crew to light me because this is like a big chrome reflective ball up here. And yes, they powder me down, but then I start sweating or the temperature, they have to do this again, again. So one day I said, hey, you guys want me to wear a cap? They're like, oh my God, that would make our job a lot easier. Now we can just light for that and we can be consistent. So that works really well, mm -hmm. super. So I started wearing the cap and it started to become part of my silhouette. And I talk a lot about the silhouette as part of your personal brand. Because if you were to make your image high contrast, the shape of your face, your ears, your nose, and your hat, or whatever, your hair, can someone tell it's you? Because it's kind of really important. In the world of branding, we design logos and symbols. They have to be distinct and memorable and functional. 
So imagine if you just created the most blocky, boring logo, no one can remember what it looks like. Starbucks is distinctive because they have the mermaid. Nike has that swoosh. So every, even McDonald's has that very iconic M, the golden arches, right? It makes a lot of sense, but most of it just show up and we're just the boring standard silhouette. So the cat breaks the silhouette and it starts to become a thing people start commenting on. So one day, one of my friends reaches out to me and says, hey, can I send you one of my caps? I said, you can send me whatever you want. There's no guarantee that I'm gonna wear it. It comes in the mail, I, I, I pull it out, I'm like, this is a good cap. I like what it says, I like the design, I'm gonna wear the cap. So I'm wearing it in the broadcast and then more and more people start saying, wow, we love the cap, where do we get the cap? And so now I have a, a relationship the, the, with the person who, who just designed the caps and has been making the cap for this 10 years. God is a designer. The God is designer. And so as I continue on in my exploration of fashion and the silhouette, and if you read books on, on fashion, they said the number one rule is change the silhouette. Hmm. Just change it. So if you wear a jacket that's a little bit cropped, it changes your waistline. If you wear really baggy pants, it changes the way that your bottom half looks. And so we can create different silhouettes and that's what's really fun. And so now I'm going down the deep end of that where I'm exploring every little thing as kind of like statement pieces so that it's not about one silhouette. It's like, what kind of funky silhouette is Chris going to show up with? And I think that starts to be evolving into my next brand. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like uh, I've just come from San Francisco mm -hmm. to LA. Yesterday I was in a creator party and I observed that SF is very much, you know, like someone who had like a crazy hundred million dollar exit would just be walking in like a black shirt, mm -hmm. black, black t-shirt yep. and like white, white shorts. Yep. And that would just be like their style. Yep. I came to LA yesterday night and I was in the creator event and everyone was wearing such really interesting clothing yep. and it had a story to tell. I would literally stop people, talk to them about what they're doing and I'd be like, tell me about your outfit. And then they'll just start talking about it for like 20 minutes. And that was really interesting for me to observe. Why do you think it matters for, for does it even matter for someone who's starting out in their career, the way they look? Yeah, I, I think it does because I've done this exercise before where I would pair up random strangers in a room and I say, without speaking, just look at a person, have them spin around and make all kinds of assumptions about who they are, what kind of car they drive, what kind of phone, what TV shows they watch, what news network, all that kind of stuff. Just make a lot of assumptions. Use your deductive reasoning skills. And then what was surprising, and because I polled the audience, I think there were 100 people there. I said, how many people felt like the other person mostly got it right? And more than half, I would say about 70, 75% of people raised their hands. I said, isn't that amazing that without saying anything, people can read who you are. Mm -hmm. Like for example, you're wearing kind of frosted plastic eye frames, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can see something about you like, you know what? I'm not gonna go for the boring frames. I'm not gonna go with metal. And there's something about that kind of, it's like ghost white with a little hint of blue maybe. Yeah, I can't yeah. tell. And so you're saying like, I'm just not going to be boring. Like maybe some of this is predictable, but at least I'm gonna zig every once in a while, right? And so there's some things that we can tell about people, about your personality, about your preferences, and we make snap decisions. When you walk down the street today and tomorrow, someone's walking against traffic like towards you, yeah. you have to make a split decision. I mean, should I be worried? Are they friendly? Do they wanna take my money? Uh, are they going to give me something? Are they going to harass me? Or are they really beautiful or interesting? Or is this somebody I need to get to know? All that's being done in a split second. And I believe that we've been evolved over 100,000 years or however long it's been to quickly identify certain signals as I like you, I'm familiar with you, or I'm intrigued by you, or I should mm. stay away from you, right? And the obvious one is when someone is looking really ragged and it, it like they're, they don't have shoes on, they're like, okay, they're having a tough time in life right now. Just give them their space. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we're making these decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. So you, even when you're starting out in your career, you're going to communicate to somebody unintentionally. I'm professional. I have high attention to detail because you can see like all the parts and pieces are together or I'm just don't really care. And not one is right or wrong. It's just the energy you want to put out there mm -hmm. and it communicates right here. Yeah. Very interesting. I now want to go on to the next section and talk about the whole being a business side of things, right? So if you don't remember, we did a podcast about two to three years ago in which the biggest advice you gave to me was to never think of yourself as a freelancer 
and think of yourself as a business. To the people who are watching this and are new to the channel, can you talk more about yep. why did you talk about that and why that is important? Yes. So if you trace the words freelancer back into its medieval roots, it's a lancer who is a hired gun mm. to fight in wars. So you might be a good swords person, uh, a warrior, and a king or a prince will hire you and you you don't really have an allegiance to anybody. Whoever pays you, you fight for and you're willing to die for that. And that's where that term originated from, freelancer. So when I ask people, are you really a freelancer? You have no kind of moral ethical guides. Whoever pays you, you do work for? And they're like, no. A freelancer is someone who does work hourly, cannot hire other people, and has your kind of time controlled by someone else. Is that what you do? It's like, no. So why do you continue to use this term freelancer? You're really an independent business owner with an employee of one. And that's okay. So you do things like marketing, sales, you do pricing, you build bids. And theoretically, then you need to move away from selling time for money. You should be focused on deliverables or results for money. And now we enter into the realm of business and we have to learn business skills. The reason why I think people use freelancer is because it's the most common way to describe, I don't work for anybody. So I also describe freelancer as you're mostly unemployed until someone <laughs> hires you, right? Yeah. And that seems a little funny too. And I think words do really matter a lot. The more that I learn about words, the more I learn that when we say certain words, they kind of betray or reveal our thinking. So if you describe your friend, let's say you're married and you say, this is my wife. Mm -hmm. Or you, or you introduce her as this is the wife. There's only one word difference, my and the. Which one do you think shows that you have a really great relationship? Which one's like showing some kind of distance? This is my wife. This is my wife. Yeah. My shows ownership. Like this is my wife, right? This is my source of joy. This is, and this is mine. Okay. So there's some possession there, which isn't hundred percent healthy, but this is the wife. There's objectivity there. There's a coldness to that. So those little word changes do mean a lot. So I want people who are not really freelancing, because there are a lot of people who are freelancers and they're using the term correctly. Most people are actually independent business owners and they're out there marketing, doing sales, customer relationships, building out their social presence. That means you're an independent business owner. And when you think of yourself as a business, now it's not business to freelancer it's business to business mm -hmm. different relationship different power dynamic i heard you talk about in a twitter space this is like 2022 that you were talking about how you were working in a job once and then you switched into the field of design what was that turning point for you which got you into this field and got you interested in it how did I originally became interested yeah, in design? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I'm 17, 18 years old. I'm living in San Jose and I've been doing a lot of uh, low skill jobs, like labor intensive work. I was working as a stock boy. I was uh, dropping French fries at the Arby's. And I thought to myself, wow, this is not really a good use of my brain, my creativity. Luck would have it that my younger brother was on the wrestling team and his coach Rudy said, hey, I know your brother does some art and design. Would he like a job working at a t-shirt place? And that would be my dream. So he introduced me to a guy that was, became my boss. His name is Brad. And I went to work for Brad. And Brad was a very talented graphic designer. He could illustrate and draw. And so he would do pencil drawings for t-shirt designs. Then he would have me ink over them using their pediograph pen, rulers, and, and French curves and things like that. And I did that. One day, Brad tells me, hey, I need you to go pick up some typesetting. I have even heard that term before. Go to Dean's place, go pick it up. So I drive over to Dean's house. I knock on the door and this guy's like, hey, I'm not ready yet. You want to come in and wait? And then I go into Dean's studio, which I didn't even know what a studio looks like. Home office. He had two drafting tables, all the, uh, all the tools that you would associate with architecture and design. So in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, what is this place? And his shelf was like so neatly designed with packaging and markers and colored pencils, things that you dream of as a kid, relatively, you know, middle class, but had the poor mindset. I didn't have any of those tools. I'm like, what do you do? He's like, well, I'm a designer. <laughs> Is this what you do for a living? He goes, yeah. Like you can support your family doing this? He goes, yes. So I pick up the typeset. 
I, I, and I leave that place and I feel like I'm floating on air because for the first time in my life, I see my future. Mm-hmm. Dean is my future. So at that moment in time, I decide I'm going to be a graphic designer. Mm-hmm. And that's the moment everything crystallized for me. Interesting. And, and then what got you to start your own agency to help people build design? You've worked with Nike as well. Yeah. Well, I was, I, I worked at two different jobs full time. I quit each one and then I was thinking, I don't like this. Let me freelance, literally freelance, go into a, a place, sell my time for hour, do timesheets or whatever. And I was thinking, I didn't like the places I worked at. I think there could be a better way. And so I was collecting notes on what kind of company I'd like to run one day. But luck would have it that my uncle called me out of the blue and it's like, hey, ever since I've known you, you've wanted to be a business owner. Would you like to run your own design company? I said, yeah, what, what's involved? He goes, well, write up a business plan. My partner and I, we're, we have, uh, we're starting like a hotel chain and we need design services. So we'll invest and put together a business plan. Fast forward, we meet at the Weston Bonaventure here in downtown and we're sitting there over dinner. And I said, I give him my business plan and I'm asking him for a hundred thousand dollars. And he reaches in his coat pocket like over dinner, I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> it just can't be real. And he pulls out a thing and he's like writing a check. And I think it was for like for $5,000. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm like 5,000 bucks in one check. <laughs> <laughs> and he just slides it across the table. Uh, and I don't know what to do with it. I'm like, what is that? He goes, it's a good faith gesture. I'm letting you know I'm interested. Let's move forward. And I'll read the business plan later, but let's move forward. So immediately I go back to the place I was freelancing. and said, hey, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. I didn't have to give two weeks notice, but I'm wrapping up my booking. Like, why, what are you doing? Start my own company. (laughs) And I remember the guy that I told that to, the executive producer, he's like, hmm, okay, (laughs) good luck with that. And I know what he was thinking. And his name is Ian, I'm still friends with Ian today. He's like, good luck with that. We'll see you coming, crawling back when things don't work out. Uh been 20 plus years, never came crawling back. Was it was it as rosy as you, the way you said it? I'm gonna start a company. Was it what? Was it as rosy when you actually started the company? No, no it was brutal. It was brutal, man. Uh, we started doing work, um, got some clients, lost all the clients, had to lay off people, how to really struggle through lots of different things, learn how to bid, do marketing. It was uh, an ugly first two years, I think. Yeah. But eventually you figure it out. Mm-hmm. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make when they start like a marketing business of their own? The biggest mistake when you're starting out in starting your own business is, do you know how to run a business? Mm -hmm. And the knowing how to run a business goes way beyond like how to price something. How do you get new leads? How do you do new business calls? How do you do sales? How do you close? It was very different and difficult for me because I come from a teacher family background. Yeah. So all of my 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 mom, my father, my grandmother, they've all been teachers. Yeah. So from that to someone who's like hiring people, like creating these pitches, doing the negotiation and everything, it was very, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have to learn all that. Plus you have this student work that doesn't feel quite right. And people can tell that student work, isn't it? There's, there's a lack of like certain refinement or it feels too wild to be real. And it took a long time for us to get like real work on our portfolio so that we can go out and get work. The other mistake that we made was I didn't have, I wasn't freelancing long enough to build enough contacts. I didn't get to see how businesses run. I was completely clueless. The third problem was, and, and, and you, you just don't know how to reach out to people. I, I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest, because I thought if you have good work, people will just call you up. <laughs> it sounds so stupid. It sounds so stupid. This Build it and they will come. Yeah, I guess. This is pre-social media. I'm literally sitting in my studio. I'm like, I wonder why people aren't calling us. Well, there's no way they would know how to even call us because we don't exist mm. to them. Yeah. Right? And there's this, um, there's a catch-22 in, in business. They don't give you work until you can show that you could do the work. Mm. But you can't show that you can do the work until they give you the work. <laughs> so you have to do a lot of spec, spec projects, speculative things, design a, a fake commercial or a fake main title, mm. but it does look pretty fake. Dummy projects. Dummy projects, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. You create your own student, like 
like assignments for you to fill out. Yeah, yeah. I asked you like the biggest advice you would have for me for my business, and you were like, you know, like my company does YouTube growth. So you were like, you know, if if someone searches YouTube growth in India, do they see your website pop up? And that was like the biggest learning for me to focus on on the outbound. uh marketing side of things but uh yeah the the time when i reached out to you you replied back by saying that, that there's no team it's all remote tell me a bit about that why did you choose to have a remote creative team what i have observed in my experience is that it gets very inefficient if you have the wrong people i've had people with whom it's been really hard to coordinate and collaborate on any design or video edit that they would make and sort of also a tip for people who are doing remote work and then how can they optimize that okay remote work wasn't the plan we have an office we have built out this incredible machine at a very expensive cost to our company and then covid happened and then everybody had to leave and because no one can work at the office they all made different decisions to move where it was best for their work life balance quality of life my my team scattered like the wind some left the country some moved to the east coast and so now we have an office with no one to work but we just have to adapt with this idea of remote teams luckily there was some dna that was already there but now we have people who've never worked with us in an office before who have only known us through remote teams you have to hire better and that means that you have to be more patient to look for the right people you have to be clear about your purpose your mission your company culture so that people are attracted to that so you're attracting the right kinds of people and repelling the wrong kind of people and we try our best and and we're not good at it in con- building the culture remotely it's very tricky to do that what do you think you've learned about hiring like in the last ex- years of experience of hiring people what has worked out for you the best I honestly think as the owner and founder that I need to be more involved in hiring mm-hmm. because I've done this enough times. I've hired hundreds of people either as freelancers or full-time employees that I now know how to look past the BS, the honeymoon phase of the interview process. And so I think when I let other people do the hiring for us, it tends to not work out. they'll see and hear certain things there's this term in sales is called happy ears where you listen for the kinds of answers you want to hear so we subconsciously ask the question in a way that you know what i want to hear mm-hmm. I'll give you an example it's like uh, tell me um are you, are you really proactive and will will take on more responsibility than what you're asked to do yeah what I'll would you that. say to that? i'll say i'll do that <laughs> of course that cuz you know this is what i'm looking for yeah yeah yep. cuz it's clear if you say no i'm going to be like oh this is not a good fit for us right 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 and we're doing this all the time so right now the way i look at it is the future's been around for 10 years technically 7 but 10 10 years right there's enough content that's out there with my voice my personality our attitude and our mission is very clear I don't want to hire anybody who's never looked at our content who aren't fans of what we do because this is a battle and we're the underdogs in a multi-year fight. It's a war and we're taking on established educational institutions to try to change the game. If you believe in that, if you want to help us do that, we need your intelligence, we need your passion to be able to do this. Someone looks at like, "Oh, you need editing? I'll edit for you." That's not who we want. We want people who are like Chris. I've been watching you for four and a half years. I know the tone and voice of this company. I have ideas on how we can take it to the next level. I would love to contribute in any which way. And so now they're working for something beyond just money. So I don't want to hire lancers. I want to hire people who are committed to the cause. So there's always the the trope within these kinds of stories about like the Game of Thrones kind of thing, <laughs> where if you're part of this house, you'll fight. to the end mm. and you'll never back down yeah. but if you're hired mercenaries and you you fight for coin mm. then when it's not it's not good for you you will switch sides and you flip and there's a couple of characters within the game of thrones universe that flip because someone's going to pay them better yeah. that's it yeah they have no allegiance but to money itself and and why is that wrong just for, for the people who are confused why is it wrong in what way to to just switch sides for the money whoever pays it's the money it's not necessarily wrong because you have an obligation to take care of yourself mm-hmm. your family if you're married if you have children your parents you got to do what's right for you 
And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm looking for someone who wants to provide for their family, but also really deeply believes in what we're trying to do. Yeah. That's important to me. We live in a time of abundance. So you get to choose who you work for and I get to choose who I want to work with me. And I want to choose people who, who share the same values, beliefs, and wants to wreck the, the current system. I want misfit rebel pirates to work with me. So when we get people who are like a little bit too inside the box and we're like, well, we're changing gears, we're changing lanes, they don't know how to process that and they freak out. I'm like, oh, I can't deal with you right now. Mm -hmm. I need some people who are like, oh, okay, that's new, let's go. We like that, that's exciting. Let's build and let's build fast. Yeah, very interesting. There's a tweet that you had, another one that I was just looking at. And the tweet is, creatives wear their emotions on their sleeves. Good for art, not good in negotiations. How do you advise creatives, could be someone who's going to design or code or video editing, to negotiate better? Because it feels like if I quote 100 and the client says 80 or 70, it feels like you know you are measuring my worth because it's something that I created. So how can they get better at negotiation? Okay, real easy. <laughs> the the way that you framed that question was excellent because you feel as if your own self-worth is being attacked. And the way you're looking at it is very self-centered. It's about what I'm worth, about what I want. But there's another person that's looking at you in the conversation that has a problem they want to solve. And they've attached a value to solve that problem. So if you want to make more money, stop thinking about yourself. Focus almost all of your energy on the other person. What's the problem we're trying to solve? Now I would add one additional piece of information. What's a really big problem that you're trying to solve and haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. the, the, the addition of the word, a big problem versus just a problem has the client now framing and looking for something that's really big. Big problems tend to be expensive to solve. The bigger the problem, the more difficult the problem, the higher the price. Mm -hmm. Like if you got a little paper cut and you went into the hospital, that's like a 25 cent problem. They just put a Band-Aid over it with a little ointment and you're good to go. If you need triple heart bypass surgery, that's not a small problem. Mm -hmm. That's going to cost a lot of money because not a lot of people can do that. And the stakes are too high. If they get it wrong, you die. If they get it right, you live longer. If the paper cut gets wrong, you might get an infection. Might, but you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for is not to be problem solvers, we're trying to become problem seekers. We're trying to look for the bigger problem. Mm -hmm. So when the client's like, this is only worth $80 to me, you're, you can say, wow, okay. Is there a problem that's more important than, than this one that you really need solving? And if they say yes, then let's talk about that because I want to focus my talent on solving the biggest problem because if I can get that off their plate, their business is going to run better. Yeah. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. We're so self-centered. And I know it's going to hurt a lot of people to hear this. And all you're thinking is about me, my art, my craft. Do you know where I went to school? Do you know who paid me last? It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. It all matters in the eye of the buyer. What's a problem they need to pay money to make it go away? Mm. Find that problem. Solve that problem. And I feel like you were also talking about how there's like a list of, of value to every service that you give to someone. Um, could be like data entry, which is at the lowest uh, part of it, then you have, you know, design and then, you know, video editing, then it comes branding and strategy. And you've talked about how that is what you can charge the most for. Why, why is that? And why should people go up the ranks? Not everyone is suited to go up the ranks, but we need to understand that there are levels to this. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to sell money. No matter what you do, if you're fixing a plumbing problem, if you're fixing a computer problem or you're fixing a brand marketing problem, you're just trying to sell money. And let me let me frame it this way. If you have a leaky pipe, which I have, first of all, it's going to destroy the house because it's affecting the floors, the foundation. And it's also jacking up my water bill. We have restrictions in California about how much water you can use. So not only am I paying more for water that I'm not using, I'm wasting water, which weighs heavy on my conscience because I don't want to waste water. We don't have enough of it, but it's really damaging my foundation. It's warping my floors. 
if I were to go in and solve that plumbing problem, instead of selling my time to fix the plumbing problem, I can say, you have a serious problem here. If you don't resolve this, this is going to get worse. And it's probably going to cost you twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to fix this. It will only cost you $200 to go in for me to re resolve this. And I guarantee the work, you won't have another problem here. I can't say about the rest of the house, but this is the problem. Okay, so in a way that you now have framed it around the problem that I'm really solving, peace of mind, my sense of right and wrong in terms of being a good steward of the environment. And also because I don't want to jack up my house. So it's one of those things where a problem solved early saves me a lot of money. A problem ignored will cost me a lot of money. Stretch in time saves nine. Yeah. So if you do data entry, how are you selling money? You really need to think about what data entry does. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, I'm, I'm just putting in numbers from a spreadsheet into another spreadsheet, what I'm really doing is I'm giving you transparency on your business so you can make more educated decisions about where you want to spend money, where costs are are unnecessary and can be eliminated. So one layer deeper in your data entry job is to not just put the numbers in like a robot, but to start to understand patterns. And if you say, if you see that quarter two, you had a big win somewhere from quarter one in terms of what the company's doing, you can point out to your, to your supervisor and say, I noticed we had a spike. Mm -hmm. And when I dug a little bit deeper, I'm seeing certain patterns. Are we aware of this? Is this something we'd like to pursue? Do you want me to look into this? It's so all of a sudden you've moved beyond the person who does this data entry. You're adding and creating value. You're selling money. The positioning is what, what matters. It's not just the positioning. It's literally because I'm looking for things to do mm -hmm. that move the needle for my boss. Your boss could be your supervisor. It could be the owner of the company. It could be your client. And so when we try to solve really big problems like marketing and branding, now all of a sudden we're not just figuring out the colors and the typefaces we want to use. We're getting into, well, if we make certain changes, it's going to have either positive or negative impact on the bottom line mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's really important yeah chris you're 51 right now i'm 52 now actually 52 now yeah it's an old tweet <laughs> amazing you've seen a lot of people my age in their 20s 30s and yeah. 40s what do you think people my age who are starting their career get wrong about life and growth in general i think if you're in your 20s, you will make the mistake of thinking you have infinite energy and you can continue to work crazy, crazy hours. Mm -hmm. I've done this. It's very hard for me to tell you not to do this, but I'm going to tell you, you have to realize you have a very long career ahead of you and that you need to pace yourself. Life isn't so much a sprint. It's a marathon. It's the ultra marathon. It never ends, actually. So you want to be able to play the game for as long as possible. And to, in order to do that, you have to take care of your mental health, your physical health, your energy, your spiritual health or whatever it is, and your relationships, you have to mind all those things. Because I do see people who wind up working to three, four in the morning, every night, night after night for five years. And when I meet them again, they don't work for me that way. They work for other people. I see them again, they're overweight. They're really tired. They have like bags in their eyes, dark circles, and they just seem like a an echo of their former selves. And it's just sad to see this. I always warn people, when you get out of school, the timer begins. It'll be five years before you're burnt out and washed up. Try to figure out how you're going to play this game for 25 years. And how do they do that? By slowing things down? No. You, you, you First, number one is you need to align yourself with the company that's going to help you grow the most. Mm. You have to be mindful of setting boundaries about what you can and cannot do. So when it comes to crunch time deadlines, you can be there. But you don't want to create a consistent habit of staying up to three in the morning every night, night after night without replenishing your energy. So, of course, we understand deadlines, pitches, those kinds of things. You need to put everything into that. Mm -hmm. And then you have to then be able to like take a break. So when we were forming our company, we, th we thought about this a lot. We know that there are going to be days when you might literally be at the office for 24 hours. And we know there's going to be slow time. And we have to respect that there's a ebb and flow, the peaks and valleys. So when we're in a valley moment, leave early. Don't show up. Regulate your time and your energy so that you can recharge. Mm -hmm. And we encourage people to do that. So sometimes we'd see people, I'm like, you don't need to be here. Go home. Just go home. You're not going to be penalized. I'm not going to judge you because you're not so hardworking. I need you to be ready for the next wave. 
And so it's hard for young people to hear that. They're like, no, I'm, I'm a gung ho. Let's go for this. So working for people that inspire you, that are going to help you to grow, that respect you and want to make sure you're going to be around for the next 10, 25 years. That's really, really important. And sometimes you have to set up some boundaries, say, okay, I will do all these things, but I cannot do this. If I'm not a good fit, I just need you to know that right up front. Yeah. Okay. How does someone identify those people who would actually care for you and want you to grow as well along with the company? <laughs> I think you can tell pretty quickly. If you visualize yourself as a fruit, maybe as an orange, mm -hmm. when you meet somebody, do they just squeeze all the juice from you? And when there's no more juice, they try to squeeze a little bit more you know them right away versus some people who squeeze a little bit of juice and like, let's make sure we like nurture this so that you can replenish yourself. I know there are tribes in Africa where they keep goats because there's not a lot of food. They don't kill the goat to eat the goat because it's kind of hard to come by with goats. What they do is they bleed them for a little bit and they drink a little bit of their blood and their milk. And that's how they get their protein and how they get their calcium mm. and protein, right? So they have a way of understanding like we need this goat to stay alive. And so we're not going to kill it. We can't because once you kill it, it's, we're done. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of understanding that your boss, your employer, your mentor needs to help to you to regulate your own energy and to make sure you're being replenished so that it doesn't get squeezed dry. We're going to do a rapid fire now. Let's do it. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And this is basically a client saying this statement. And I want to know what would you reply with? Okay. All right. So the client says, Chris, you're too expensive. I say, what is expensive for you? And and uh, they'll be like, you know, this is too expensive. You're charging $100 for this design. This is too expensive. Okay. So what what is this supposed to be then? Hmm. You want to apply? <laughs> you apply with me. Let, let's say that they say that I want it to be done by $70. $70? Okay. Have you been able to find somebody to do this for $70 that you like? Hmm. And if they say yes, you should work then you should them. work with them. You should work with them. <laughs> I don't want to make you pay $30 more. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, will those $30 that you save be worth it to you? Mm. Because you have to manage them a little bit more. Maybe you'll be wondering like why it's not hitting all the marks for you. Mm. Another question they'll ask is, uh, Chris, I don't like what you've made. Can you change this? But they don't give you a particular feedback. I would love to change it, but let's try and identify where you'd like it to go. Can you articulate things? Can I show you some examples when you can give me some feedback as to what you like and don't like about it? Because mm. I think I can hit it for you. I just need your help in defining what it is. There are so many uh, memes, right? Like a client says, you know, change something about this. I don't I don't like this, but I don't know what, what they want. Yeah. And then the designer is just scr scratching their head and they're like, what do you, what do I make? Yeah, but this is where I think designers get this all wrong. <laughs> The, the clients aren't supposed to know how to tell you mm. what they want or how to fix it. Imagine you go into the doctor and like, you're supposed to tell the doctor, well, it's, it's my kidney and I have X, Y, and Z problem. Can you fix that? No, you just go in. It's like, I'm feeling funny. Do you think the doctor is supposed to get frustrated because you can't articulate it? No, that's a sign of a professional. They're like, okay, let's diagnose a couple things. When do you feel this first? And did you have any kind of injury? Have you been changing your diet? What has changed? So they're looking for the variables there. Mm -hmm. And let me just do a couple of tests. Let me push on certain parts of your body and see if you feel any pain. Yeah. Let's do a quick blood test, urine test. Let's put you under a scan or an x-ray and see if there's anything else that's going on inside. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that they know what they're doing because of the kinds of questions they ask. A professional, having seen the problem many times, will ask you two or three questions and be able to narrow it down so quickly. And they're going to say something like, I suspect you're having a failed kidney, but let's do a couple more tests to make sure before we do some serious surgery. Mm -hmm. That's how you know. Very interesting. Chris, can you do this for free? And then later on, if we, if we like your work, we can pay you for that. Well, let me ask you, do you do work for free? Me? The client. Oh yeah, the client. I'm responding to the client right now. The, the client would pay. The client would ask for payment for from the... Yeah, is there a situation where you give your services away for free? I don't. Well, why would you expect me to do the same? Hmm. So, so you're saying that people should never work for free for I like a demo? That. No. What if they say, yes, we do do work for free? <laughs> and then? And then I say, tell me the situation. <laughs> so, okay. So you get this because of that. 
are you offering me that? Then I might consider doing it for free. Yeah. So for example, they're like, well, we did a deal with IBM because of the PR value and we're going to be featured in Forbes magazine. Mm -hmm. I'm like, fantastic. Are you IBM? <laughs> are you going to help me to be featured in Forbes? Because that's worth something to me. Yeah. I don't want to discount that. Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell hundred friends to hire me? Mm -hmm. No. So we're not comparing apples to apples. So here's the thing. I heard this from Tony Robbins. He said something like the number one motivating factor that that propels humans forward is their their desire to be consistent with themselves. That's why I ask people questions back. So when they say, Chris, would you do this for free? I'm just like, tell me a time when you've done work for free and what you've gotten from it. Mm -hmm. And if they can't tell you, then they say, oh, I see what you're saying. Mm. Because they need to be consistent with themselves, right. not consistent with me. The last thing I want to do is respond from an emotional place, from a self-centered place. Like, oh, I don't do work for free. That's insulting. Why would you? It doesn't help them. It doesn't help the conversation. Yeah. Couple of more questions. What are your top three favorite fonts that you love using? Oh, that's super, super easy. Right now, I'm using Helvetica Now from Monotype. I'm using... Knockout also from Monotype because they bought Hoffler Type Foundry and I might mix in their caliber. Mm -hmm. What's like a book that you recently read that challenged your beliefs and your mindset, which made you think differently? I'm still grinding through it right now, but Implementing Value Pricing is an eye-opening book and it's a kind of book where you can read two pages, you have to stop, you have to really think about it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. The last question is that if you were in my shoes of Ishan Sharma today, what one question would you ask Chris Do? I don't know what question I'm mean, think. You've <laughs> asked a lot of good questions already. Usually the question I would ask myself is, what would you do, do differently knowing what you know now? Mm -hmm. But the weird thing is you're already doing it. I started creating content when I was 42 years old, as you pointed out in my tweet. I'm 52 years now, and I'm starting to feel like I'm just coming into my prime, if you will. Uh, I'm, I've just recently featured in Inc. Magazine. I was on a TV show for Amazon Prime. I just got back and received their version of a Lifetime Achievement Award from NAP. And I feel like I'm just getting started. And so I look at it like, what would happen if I started when I was 32 yeah. or 22? And you look like you're barely 25. I'm 23 right now. 23? Yeah. See, so I got it right. You're barely 25. That means you're doing exactly what I want. I should have been doing, but I didn't have the wherewithal. Mm -hmm. And so you're so far ahead of the game. I can't even imagine where you're going to be when you're my age, because then you would have put in 30 years of content creation. I see that you're like 800,000 ish on Instagram, right? Over one and a half million on YouTube. So you're just so far ahead of the game. And for I'm, I'm just saying this to to your audience follow this man understand what he's doing because despite his young age he's acting like a much more mature person i think sometimes people come into existence with a much wiser soul than their physical age and they act differently and they behave in ways that are way beyond their years and this is a template to follow mm -hmm. learn to be a better communicator learn to be brave learn to take certain risk in your life calculated risk but take some risk in your life because Calm seas never make great sailors. You got to get out there and you got to sail the rough waters and find out what you're made of. Yeah, I love that quote. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking out the time. This was Limitless with Ishan episode with Chris. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in the next one. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody.